The TCG Design Theory Podcast is part of the Booster Pack Network. For more TCG-related content, visit theboosterpacknetwork.com. All right, everybody, welcome to the TCG Design Theory Podcast. My name is Jay, and today we have Justin Parnell, who is the Organized Play Manager for North America Equinox. Uh, So, Justin, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Jay. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so uh, a lot of our episodes kind of revolved or have revolved around more of the design of, of a, you know, specifically the trading card game and things like that. But it's good to get into some of the operational logistics and those types of things. So um, really excited to talk about this. But before we begin, um, can you kind of run us through a little bit about how you got started in the TCG space and the tabletop space in general? Absolutely. I've been, you know, I've been into tabletop games my entire life. So as long as I can remember, and not just, you know, things like uh, Monopoly or Scrabble. I have, you know, old board games from the 90s still on my shelf back here. Um, and I really started to get into TCGs in 1998. The first one that I personally played was the original Star Wars TCG. Not the, you know, though I think we've had about five since then. The one from uh, Decipher. And then moved on to Pokemon and then got into Magic in 1999. And have been uh, playing Magic Strong for 25 years. I've played about a dozen other TCGs probably along the way, but uh, I've been as a, as a fan and a player for you know the vast majority of my life in into this space, specifically in TCGs. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, obviously being a fan of trading card games and and things like that, what kind of nudged you in the direction of wanting to have a career in this type of space? Right. So, uh, you know, it it was primarily focused on magic. And honestly, that is where most of my experience and, you know, love for this industry has come from. And professionally, I moved over to the, you know, not just a fan side, but working in its side. In uh, 2013, I started to work for Star City Games. I ended up being there for 10 years. I was the purchasing manager, primarily focused on inventory acquisition and management, but I was also part of the uh, admin team that put on all of our uh, SCG tour, SCG con. We've had so many names over the years, all, all of those events uh, for an extended period of time. Okay. And so you would say that that's primarily uh, the experience that you're drawing upon for like organized play and things like that. Right. You know, I, I, as, as someone that has been a part um, as a player of many, many organized play systems, um, seeing things come and go, seeing things that worked and didn't work. And then being a part of that from um, the tournament organizer side, not necessarily as the kind of developer and publisher side, which is where I am now, but from the tournament organizer retailer side, significant amount of experience there and seeing how those systems can can work and how sometimes they can fail. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, with that, um, you know, a lot of a lot of things that uh, people tend to talk about when they, when it comes to you know trading card games and stuff in general about the longevity of those types of games is you know how is the organized play is there a good community is there support for you know local game stores and things like that um, but in your opinion with with the games that you've played and you know obviously working on a project uh, that's you know very successful right now that being altered TCG um, kind of walk me through is it is it completely necessary for a trading card game to have organized play. Is it necessary? No, it's not necessary. But I would say that it's really, really important for your communication to be clear from the developer. Uh, And as long as you are clear of what level of organized play you're going to have, and that could be none, I think that can work fine. You know, players and retailers really just need to know what they're getting into when they dive into a game from a financial standpoint. How is that going to be supported from the development end to the other two kind of core user groups, which are players and retailers? You're you're likely, you know, kind of capping your your stake in the market by opting to not expand it to an area that has high demand. But as long as you manage expectations and communicate honestly and clearly uh, from what your involvement is as a developer, then it can be acceptable and doable. Mm-hmm. And so, where do we where do we draw the line between 
you know, uh, designer and publisher supported uh, organized play and um, just kind of um, encouraged organized play at a, at a fan level. Um, you know, where does right. where does that uh, tr- transition happen? Yeah, I think that's I think that's a very good question. And a lot of games that don't have kind of official organized play really uh, want to support organized play efforts from outside of the the sphere of the publisher. And, you know, you see this happen a lot. Oh, actually, you know what? I talked about Star Wars TCG for, that was from the 90s, right? So that, that game died in early 2000s. But events continued from fans for years, maybe decades even. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're still going. Um, and, you know, the various publishers that have owned that license have 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 encouraged that to continue. So uh, what you really have is kind of a difference in saying, we are going to actively support this effort as a developer to construct these systems for organized plays to function. Now, that could be through very small level, as in, you know, at the LGS level, local game store level, or that could be through convention level or higher you know you have your professional circuit perhaps um then on the other side you could just say well you know we're not going to be supporting any specific organized play but we encourage you to and we will we will you know promote your efforts to do so maybe we're going to put listings on our our website maybe there's an event finder but it's all done through fans and people that are not being compensated in any way uh any way or form to do that there's no prizing that is being distributed from the developer to the people that are running the tournaments. And that to me, that is where the, the O in organized play comes in organized. And that, as far as I'm concerned, has to do with official organization from the developer. And if you don't have that capital O in organized, then you don't have OP in the traditional sense. Doesn't mean that you, your game can't have, have events, but it's, um, it, it is, it, it does take a slightly different form when, when the developer and publisher are involved. Mm-hmm. And, with with organized play, uh, so personally, I've I've only heard not only but mostly heard of organized play when it comes to trading card games and games like that, where there's uh, this expectation of of expansion and uh, moving forward. Right. And of, of course, there's other game models that expand without the collectible aspect of it. Um, would you say there's any difference between those two things in terms of organized play at you know whatever level between collectible games and non collectible games? Right. So if we're asking about like TCGs compared to like CCGs, so TCGs being trading card games, CCGs being collectible card games and LCGs being living card games, I believe is the term that Fantasy Flight has coined through their their various efforts doing that. Um, In in between that kind of group, uh, it doesn't need to change a whole lot. You know, it's tough to have the the breadth of organized play as a non-TCG due to how CCGs and LCGs work at retail, but if the game is strong and popular, it doesn't necessarily need to be any difference. Um, again, it's it's more about uh, expectation managing, and for for more traditional hobby games like you know board games that you find at your local game store, um, it's it's difficult to institute more formal organized play because things aren't changing. You know, you have. Um, so one of my, one of my favorite games is, which I think is a lot of people's is terraforming Mars, you know, one of my favorite board games, right. And terraforming Mars has half a dozen expansions and you can opt in to play in the expansion. You can not play the expansion, but ultimately if you're looking at the base level game of terraforming Mars, uh, it's based, you know, it stayed the same for the better part of a decade since it's released. It's kind of just what the game is. Strategies kind of might evolve as people, you know, that at a high level that are playing the game have a better understanding, but Ultimately, if you look at a Terraforming Mars event, a competitive event that's happening at Gen Con in 2018, and you look at one that happened in 2013, it'll look very similar, right? Uh, Whereas TCGs, quite different in a five-year span, could look, uh, you know, if you you take something like Magic the Gathering, could look entirely different in a five-year span. So it's... um, 
it's it's really just about knowing what you're getting into as a as a player and a tournament organizer of um, what is going to be the draw to keep people coming back to this space from an organized play perspective. Mm-hmm. And you know, I hear a lot of comments about um, you know uh, the competitive players and, and the players who are you know spending X amount of dollars on these competitive decks are the ones keeping the game alive. And then I hear people saying, "Well, you know, there's a bigger casual drive that that keeps these games right. alive." Um, you know, so you know, in your experience, what, um, you know, which, how, how do both of those audiences kind of play into the economy of a game? And, um, you know, how, I guess, how do you work that in with organized play with those hyper competitive right. players? Also, knowing that people are going to be introduced to the game and may face some of those, uh, you know, types of uh, players. Well, absolutely. And I love that question, because something that, um I think people that are the, uh, not necessarily competitive people, the people that are kind of in that 1% of investment for a game, they usually look at the other people that are in that 1%, right? Whether that's online, at their local store, with social media, and they say, oh, this is the largest represented group for this game. And, and that's what they say. And I mean, I can tell you, I can tell you as, as a retailer of um, the, you know, having been a retailer of the largest independent magic, the gathering store for 10 years, um, the, the casual base that is not a part of that 1% that doesn't necessarily, you know, have a huge, you know, following online and isn't involved in every conversation. uh, They dwarf any other group. It's not even, not even in the neighborhood of being close. But to kind of get back to your question at large, so how do you manage that between organized play for for both groups? Well, a lot of people, people kind of in that 1% group, look at organized play and they think competitive play, right? They think they think tournaments and maybe, uh, maybe, maybe that means isolated tournaments, maybe that means a progression or like qualifier system, maybe it means the highest level of professional play for games that have that. But to me, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. Um, organized play simply just means uh, a way that the the developer, and usually in conjunction, uh, often with retailers, so local game stores or or places perhaps that um, that run events regularly. You know, you like you could have a, a game cafe that has a a Monday night Pokemon night, or you know, a library that has Pokemon night once a week, right? Um, and as long as that's supported from the developer, that's organized play. Those are not going to be competitive. But it's it's a place for people to be able to come that's part of the official system and saying, yeah, this is supported by whatever the developer for this game is as organized play. But a lot of people that are kind of in that larger group that are focused on OP as being competitive play, they don't they don't kind of view it like that. But those types of programs are critically important because that second group, that kind of silent majority that is not in, not invested in the game from the highest level, and they're not talking about it every single day on social media, it's not dominating their lives, they're maybe treating it like uh, more like a board game night. You know, once a week, they go to this place, they play in this event for a couple hours, they're not so worried about winning and losing or keeping up with all of the latest uh, things that are happening in the metagame, but it's a, it's a place for them to go and interact with people that are like-minded that just want to be able to play the game and maybe get a cool promo card or something. That's OP. Those are both, those are both OP. OP can exist at the highest level where you're taking, you're, you're trying to crown a world champion. It can exist at, at a low level of someone that doesn't even know what the different formats of your game are. They simply just have cards, have a deck, and they want to be able to engage with that with people that are in the same, same group. So it's tough to manage both of those, but it also is important to identify both of those groups because if you don't, you will lose them. I mean, that's straight up. You, if you, if, if, if you look at the players that are playing your game and invest in your game and your brand and you say, you know what, we're not going to worry about this group. Well, over time, it will be difficult for you to continue to have that group be invested in your game, especially for a TCG, because Kind of the nature of TCGs is you have expansions coming out every three, four, five, six months, right? Well, in that six month period, or over maybe over a year, you stop supporting one of that groups. Well, maybe they're not so keen to to pick up 
you know, whatever the latest expansion is or be as invested in the community. And that's something that, um, you know, you can kind of erode away your player base by not taking care of, of all of the different angles. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to serve everyone to the degree they want, because you often never will, you know, if if you, you play TCG. So, you know, it's, we always want more than we're going to be able to get. And that's okay. It's okay to ask, but uh, you know, just as long as, as those players are served and those groups are served in some way there, that's, that's the draw for them to come back. Right. And I'm really happy that you made that distinction uh, with organized play between, you know, these high level events and, you know, these casual level events, because, um, you know, I, I get into the bad habit of it too. When I hear organized play, the first thing I think of is tournament, right? Uh, right. You're, you're buying in, um, you're trying to win, you're, you're playing somewhat competitively, right? Um, but yeah, completely disregarding the casual side of it, which, uh, you know, I've been to more than my fair share of uh, cafe board game nights and things like that. And um, absolutely have seen people playing, you know, magic and Pokemon and you know, all types of stuff. So, um, you know, it really is just kind of a spectrum of, you know, from casual to competitive, what organized play can do. Um, and, and, you know, there's there's the obvious benefits, which, you know, uh, it kind of gets more engagement with your, um, you know, your fans and your players. But uh, what are some of the other benefits of organized play um, at any level? You know, we can start with casual and go to competitive, but what does it do for, you um, you know, a designer and a publisher of a trading card game to have solid organized play. All right. Well, I mean, I'm obviously I'm biased on this question. <laughs> but, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but several. I think the, the the first is and and maybe the biggest one is confidence. You know, organized play is the developer saying they're invested in the future of this game. Because organized play is not just a singular instance. It's a it's a system that you're creating. It speaks to the players and the retailers because OP ultimately is marketing where they can see where the dollars are going. You can actually see how that developer or publisher is invested in the the system that is going to grow the brand. So that is a huge one. And just saying confidence, saying, hey, look, if you can come to this event and we want you to come to this event, this is what we're going to do to incentivize you to do so. And that's that is a if it's done well, it's a win 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 for everyone. Uh, The second is retailer support. And this is. I mean, this is, in my opinion, super critical, but I think having in-store organized play systems that directly benefit retailers create a symbiotic relationship uh, directly with the developer. And the third, um, well, I mean, really the third is just allowing for for natural community creation, uh, not something that, you know, you are trying to manufacture as a as a developer, but saying, hey, this is a space where you can come and be, be engaged in this community and kind of create your own community. And, um, you know, having OP systems for TCGs allows for a very natural community fostering. This can be at, at, like we talked about at LGSs. This could be at board game cafes. This could be at uh, regional conventions. This could be at large competitive tournaments at the highest level. Um, but because of the constantly rotating nature of TCGs with new releases, they're able to benefit more from OP than all of the other, if not every other physical card and board game, really, because there's always a driver to re-engage with the community when something new happens, which is is frequent. So I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it, it takes a lot of effort because it's um, anything that is kind of marketing and, you know, full disclosure, I'm, you know, organized play manager for North America, but I'm part of the marketing department, right? And the organized play manager for Europe, part of the marketing department. So that's what it is. Uh, but it that doesn't have to, that doesn't have to marketing doesn't have to be a dirty word if it's if it's something that we say you know this is this is how we are, we are wanting to engage you because we want you to be excited about playing our game and here's what we can do to engage you to do that and if it's if it's communicated clearly and it's done well all three groups and I think that there are three major groups when you're talking about organized play there's the developer of course. There's the players, but there's also the retailers. And I think if, if it's communicated clearly and done well, all three of those groups can benefit. Yeah. And, and I've, I've seen it, you know, I've, I've talked to my fair share of, um, you know, LGS owners and things like that. And, um, you know, heard their stories about, um, you know, magic or Pokemon or, or whatever kind of support that they're getting um, or uh, stipulations that are required by those developers for uh, organized play and things. And it's, it's always interesting to hear the differences there. But I'm glad you also... Um, 
you know, mentioned that marketing is not a, uh, it's not this taboo word that is like, Ooh, you know, it's like spooky and, you know, trying to get you to buy something. Um, right. marketing is simply the act of, Hey, we have this thing and we want to let you know about it. Um, right. exactly. and so organized play is a perfect way to do that. Um, you are much more likely to have a memorable moment, um, playing with somebody or talking about, not even playing, honestly, you can talk about a card game, just engaging, yeah. just engaging in the community, right. Right. uh, in person and you would online, uh, cause you're putting a voice, a face and a time and a feeling to the, to the situation. So, uh, it's critical, hugely important. And I agree, which, you know, leads me weirdly to this next question, <laughs> which is in your opinion, in your very biased opinion, um, is right. there anything that organized play can do that would actually harm a game? Um, in your opinion that you've seen? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's, that's fair. Okay. So I think that there are two things. Uh, the first is the first is simple. Um, but broken promises from the developer, right? That's, that's obvious, but in my opinion, it matters more for organized play than retail products, because again, OP is about creating systems for the community to interact together. The retail product is just saying, Hey, we're going to sell you, we're going to sell you this as the, you know, first starts at the developer, then moves to the distributor, then to the retailer, then to the consumer. That's a, you know, the, the product itself is isolated, but organized play is, is a product that's not isolated. So if you say, Hey, we're going to do this and we want you to invest in the system and you don't do it. Okay. Well, that's, um, that creates a, a lot of, um, discomfort I'll say with, with your other two kind of, uh, core consumer groups of, of retailers and customers. So I think that's an obvious one. Um, the second one, and this is this is tougher. This has been a fail point for a lot of games. Is creating a, a system that is unsustainable for one of those three parties. That's either the developer, the player, or the tournament organizer slash retailer. A lot of times, the TO is the retailer. The tournament organizer and the retailer often are are side by side because for you know for local level organized play, you're doing that in a in a local game store, right? So, but I'll say, I'll say TO for tournament organizer. So if it's unsustainable for one of those three parties, and usually by sustainable, I mean financially sustainable. If the system isn't suited financially to all of those groups, you risk doing harm to your brand and the game. And for new games, especially ones with no IPs attached, I mean, like altered, we are, we are not, we are working with our own IP. We're not working with an, an, an IP that is, you know, we are attached to that can be tough or impossible to come back from. Because basically, you if, if you create a system where any any of those groups say, "Hey, I I can't I can't keep up with this. Like it's too much money. I'm not I'm not being able to make enough back, or I don't feel like I'm getting enough back." For retailers, because it's a business for them, if they have to put um, you know their own money and and whatever form that takes into running organized play events, well, that those aren't going to exist for a long time. If it's too costly for players to engage in those, whether it's uh, by travel or the frequently that they are feel like they are required to play in organized play events also can be harmful. And for the developer, well, if you make your organized play reward so robust, you're actually losing money on it. Well, I mean, that one's obvious. You're the one that makes the game. So that can't, that that's only so long that can happen. Mm -hmm. and, and I've actually, I've had conversations where, um, you know, uh, LGS owners have talked about, um, you know, not getting, not necessarily getting that consistent um, organized play price support and things like that. And then, you know, kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, footing the bill, um, mm -hmm. you know, to keep players engaged and, and things like that. Um, you know, and, and from an OP perspective, um, or I should say a developer's perspective, um, how is important, how important is it to, you know, offer that price support and, and make and, and take as much burden off of the LGS owners as, as you can? Well, it has to be it has to be equitable for both sides. You know, it's it's difficult for one side to expect the other side to do all of the work. It's it's it puts a lot of stress on the developer, um, usually in ways they're not able to respond to. If a retailer is saying, "Well, you need to provide me with everything. You need to provide all of the prizes. You need to provide all of the marketing. I simply just have it in my store, and I'm not doing any of the work." Okay, well, that's not something that's going to be successful for, for either side. And same on the other way. It's like, okay, if the retailer is saying, okay, I am doing all of the work in, in creating drivers for players to come to my stores, but I'm, I'm buying product and supplying it as price support or, um, 
I am creating a, a larger tournament system for your game and there's no assistance from the developer, that's also not, not going to work out long term. So it has to, it has to be both. Uh, to have a successful, long-lasting relationship for a game is the developer has to be able to provide something. And oftentimes that's in the way of oftentimes that's in the way of price support and, uh, you know, marketing, maybe driving, uh, maybe creating a system that drives players to your stores. So saying, OK, we have this maybe it could be a tournament series. There's qualifiers going on and we're going to tell you where these qualifiers are and tell you this is where you need to go. And this store is in particular one of those. But on the store hand, you need to be able to make sure that you are creating an environment that's positive enough for players to want to play in your events. Um, a lot of organized play happens kind of in the constraints, uh, loosely in the constraints of the system that's been created for a game. So I look at this as a store might, uh, we'll just use magic as an example, because this is, uh, you know, been around the longest. I think people are the most familiar with it. FNM is kind of an institution in the TCG world. It happens on one day. Um, you're going to get consistent uh, rewards as a player, and it's supported from the developer level to the retailer level. Is that the only magic tournament that goes on in stores? Absolutely not. Most most events that happen in retailers are not events that are specifically supported by Wizards of the Coast, but it allows them to operate in their system previously with uh, being you know an official event that we had to put into your DCI number. Now going through the companion app, which is an official, you know, um, wizards kind of, uh, low, small scale, um, organized play manager for the tournament organizer. But it, those are created by the retailer or the tournament organizer to say, Hey, we're going to create this event or maybe event series that happens every week. It's not F and M it's not, you know, it's not a pre-release. But it's something else where a, a player can come and and participate and we're going to be providing all of the rewards and we're going to, you know, get all of um, all of the benefits of players coming to our store, whether that is, um, you know, paying paying money for entry, whether that's uh, encouraging them to buy singles or other products in their store, et cetera, building a community. So both of those things have to happen because you have to you have to allow for stores to do that. And especially in the United States. And I'm you know, my experience, we're trying to create a, go, a global game with Altered. And my experience is in the, how it works in the United States and I guess the English speaking parts of Canada, so to speak. And um, I know that's how it works. That's how it's always worked. You're going to have retailers that are going to want to create their own events and run their own events. And I think that that's wonderful. I think that that is extremely helpful to everyone if those can be done successfully. But you need to make sure that you create a system to allow for that where organizers, tournament organizers don't feel like they have to kind of go out of bounds to create something that's attractive for their community. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, talking about with um, you know, setting up a system where everybody can kind of succeed and you're always going to have kind of unofficial events uh, being run, even if you have a very robust organized play structure, you're always going to have those people kind of running their own tournaments and things like that. Um, so there's obviously a lot of things that go into organized play. Uh, it's a very, it can be a very big thing. As we discussed before, it can be very casual. It can be very competitive. Um, so with that in mind, with organized play, um, what, you know, where in the process of, of creating and designing a trading card game uh, should people even begin to th start thinking about this? And of course, I'm not talking about just tournaments, but even just, um, you know, not so much like, oh, we're getting together to play test the game, but I'm ready to kind of tell people, hey, I'm ready to go to an LGS, right? And I'm ready to say, hey, you like trading card games? I'm, I'm working on one. Um, and, and you're kind of doing that little little bit of self-marketing. Um, when do those first steps start coming in? That's a great question. The tough one It's a tough question to answer. I mean, I think one of the very specific answers to this question is to when you start thinking about it is immediately uh, because it might adjust your design, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean you need to create systems right off the bat, but have in your mind, um, am I going to have organized play for this game or not could affect your design because OP can have an effect on development from a rules perspective. 
you know, if, if you have a game that, um, you know, we've probably all played board games that the rule books are loose. I'll just put it that way. Maybe you have to fill in the blanks sometimes. Well, for, for organized play, uh, those are the type of things that create, uh, friction. The easiest is if you aren't, don't have rules clear with how your game operates because organized play inherently is asking a player to say, I like this game so much. I want to go outside of my comfort zone to go to a location that's not my home to play against another person that I've never met before. And we're going to enter into this agreement that we're going to be playing the game by the same rules. If you're playing, I'll use Terraforming Mars again. If you're playing Terraforming Mars in in your dining room, you and your friends can can interact with that however you want. You can go by the rule book if you want to make your own rules. Everyone's on the same page. It doesn't really matter. But for organized play in in public spaces, the rules have to be solid to where there is no friction between two people that don't know each other that want to play the game. So on that basis, you have to at least have an idea of a yes or no. Maybe not necessarily the system, but yes or no, do you want to support it? Because if the answer is yes, you need to think about that from a rules perspective and not create the game in a way that makes it very, very difficult to answer those questions by the time you get to it. So that's kind of part one of my answer. Uh, part two is identifying like who who are you trying to serve here? Like who do you think that your who do you think that your player base is going to be? And you don't necessarily you don't always know that when you're you're kind of starting down the design path of of creating a TCG. And I would say when you figure that out, when you say, hey, I think this is going to be the group that's going to be the most, in <clears throat> excuse me, the most engaged with the product that I'm making, that's probably when you start to say, okay, well, now is, is organized play something that I want to try to support, or is it going to be something that players are going to expect that I'm supporting? And then I think that's when, that's when that conversation should start happening. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a good point. That's a, you know, um, cause I've always kind of assumed that with uh, trading card games, you have, uh, you're just naturally going to have both, but, um, there definitely is, um, you know, you can, you can start gearing that towards, um, you know, like whatever experience you want as a, as a designer and developer kind of seeing, you know, which group is going to be a little bit more of your focus up front. Um, so not just, but, you know, not just with organized play, but, you know, obviously we, we talk about it pretty simply in terms of, oh yeah, you know, we just, you know, set, set these things up and Friday night magic and, and all this stuff. But, you know, there's, there's obviously a lot of logistics that go into these types of things. Um, you know, it can be simple, like at a board game cafe or at a LGS and just kind of doing a consistent game night. Um, but let's talk about some of the things with, um, you know, kind of just events in general, like, you know, what, what are the, what are some of the things that go into setting up events? Um, how do you, you know, who do you, who are you calling? Where, where are you looking to see um, where to host events and, and where to do these things? Like, what are the, some of those first steps to, to take care of that stuff? Right. Well, I mean, the first, the first step of all is uh, you need to identify your goals. What are what is your goal for creating this? What are you, what type of players are you trying to attract? Uh, are the players you expect to participate uh, he heavy, the most heavily in organized play, the same players that are the target market for the game? Is your organized play system uh, attractive to retailers and tournament organizers? It's better to ask yourself one too many of those questions than one too few. And that goes into, you know, if let's say you're trying to set up like a, a regional tournament, We'll use that as an example that you know you brought up as far as like location. Well, have you have you talked to retailers that are in that local area to understand their communities and how their communities interact with your game? So it's I, I really don't think I, I think that if you start going down this path and you don't stop and say, have I asked all the questions and you just blaze right past that, the chances are very good that you have not asked all of the questions and you're going to make your make it more difficult for yourself to to create an event like a physical event um that that doesn't work that doesn't necessarily mean that it won't go off uh that the event won't happen but there's a world of difference in a well-run event and a poorly run event and 
usually the poorly run events just haven't asked themselves enough questions. So without getting into specifics, I will just say that. I think that I think that, that is really the way uh, to make sure that you are not shooting yourself in the foot is, is to make sure that you are asking all of the questions and stopping and saying, have I asked all the questions? And the answer is probably no. Mm-hmm. Keep asking more. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, being, being kind of like an operations manager kind of in, you know, my career, um, thinking ahead and, and, and planning for all those like ABC scenarios, um, is definitely important. And, you know, I think, I think a lot of people get, um, a little nervous when it comes to that, you know, cause you're, you are having to set up and, and organize this, you know, it, it is like anything else that is being organized. Um, you're having to plan things and set times and, and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, with, with so much effort that goes into, you know, a lot of these organized events, um, and aside from like prize support and things like that, what are some other incentives or other ways that developers can um, get people to want to come out? As you said, you know, it's people getting out of their comfort zone, playing against a stranger, um, <laughs> which can be very daunting. So what are some other right. ways to incentivize that? Yeah, I mean, well, we, as you said, you know, there's a lot of different ways to incentivize at different levels. I think rewards is a big one. So I don't want to, I don't want to just blaze past that because rewards doesn't necessarily need to be, um, it doesn't need to be like a, you know, like a, a card, right. That you're getting it doesn't necessarily need to be that, but it could be that it could be a participation reward that is saying, Hey, just come and just come and play in our event. doesn't matter if you win. doesn't matter if you lose, we're just going to, we're going to reward you for participating. Uh, it could be something that is maybe a season long, you know, from from one point to another point that rewards you based on repeated play. Or, and I think getting more to kind of the specifics of your question, the 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 driver or the reward could be a unique experience. You could be, you know, you could be able to play in a a way that you interact with this game that you wouldn't be able to do at home with your friends. Um, those are some of my favorite type of events at, at large TCG conventions that I've gone to are the ones that's like, Oh, this is a very cool event that I wouldn't have a chance to play in normally. And those are the things whether, and that that could be at a, at a large convention that could be at your local game store, but basically creating an event that you're not able to access on your own as a player. Those are some of the best things that you can do to incentivize participation in your organized play system. Do something where players can't just do the same thing at their house with their buddies, right? You want to say, hey, you need to come here to this place to participate in in this event that's happening and you will be rewarded in some way. Whether that, again, that could be physical card rewards, it could be something that's leading up to something else like a season-long reward or again, an experience, but I think it needs to be something like that. It needs to be something that is different than they can do on their own. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've, we've hit on a lot of great points in terms of um, how to do organized play properly and things like that. Uh, the benefits of organized play. Um, but let's kind of sum up some of the, some of your tips uh, for someone who has no experience. Um, has never been to an organized play event, has never thought about it or anything like that, uh, but thinks about, okay, well, maybe I should start taking these steps. Um, let's summarize what you think, um, some of the main focus points need to be so they're not wasting their efforts um, and really, you know, succeeding at creating a good experience. Right. So this is some, this would be for like a, like a new, a new, someone that's like developing a TCG or kind of creating this. Okay. Well, uh, I'll start by saying that Equinox is new. You know, we um, are altered is launching August 26th. So we're new. We're in the same boat. So I'll just give you, I'll give you kind of what we're what we're thinking, what I'm thinking. Um, man, I, I, I'll you know I'm going to narrow it down to one one tip that I'll talk about a little bit, and that is to be humble, um, be a student of the genre. This TCGs have existed for 31 years now. Magic the Gathering released in 1993. There's hundreds of TCGs that have come and gone in that amount of time and even come and gone in the 25 years since I've been involved in kind of in in this world. And 
it's a combination of, you know, what is the phrase? If you're not, if you don't, you know, learn about the past, you're doomed to repeat the mistakes, something like that. Um, I mean, that's a big one. Um, everyone wants to try something new and innovate. And I think that's necessary. That's the only way that TCGs as a genre will continue to exist is by innovation and people trying to do things new. But there are also certain areas where you don't want to try to reinvent the wheel because it might not roll the way that you expect it to if you do that. And I would just say, why are you, first of all, why are you making a new TCG? Is there something that is a draw to you that is different than what you can get from other other things that exist already? Hopefully the answer is yes, because if the answer is no, well, you're probably not going to have a successful product. If the answer is is yes, there is something new. Okay, wonderful. How can you focus on that concept while still making sure that you pay attention to the past of all of the TCGs that's come and gone. And I've said this to a couple people, but you know, we have a graveyard of TCGs to look at of things that didn't work. And we would be foolish to not pay attention to some of those things so we can avoid the same mistakes. And for someone that's making a new TCG, Altered has an incredible team. We have over 30 employees in our studio. I'm one of the newer ones. I've only been here a few months. Um, I think there's only one person that's newer than me. And um, it's a lot of people that are very passionate about the product that have a lot of experience in the TCG realm. And I can promise you in our 30 person studio, the, the awareness of saying we don't want to repeat mistakes that other games have done that have kind of caused their demise or caused them to, you know, kind of slowly wither away um that's important like that's important to look at we're we're pretty we're pretty deep as far as this this specific genre in this hobby um you have the very first one still going strong magic's you know 31 years this year which is incredible they've made a ton of amazing innovations they've made a ton of mistakes uh they've survived but a lot of other games have not find out about this why 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 was that the case? Why did this game not survive? Why did this why is this other game doing well? Those are the things that you need to know because I mean education especially in the, you know, for better or worse, most of the history of all of these games uh are in the internet era, so you can probably find out the questions to most of the the things that you were seeking, but um be humble, ask questions, find out what is your game going to be doing differently? Doesn't have to be just gameplay, but gameplay. But what is your game doing differently, and why is that attractive to people? And how can you make that work while avoiding the pitfalls of those that came before you? Right, and I'm sure, like you said, your team, you know, y'all's team of thirty plus have you know asked yourselves that question. Um, but I guess now's a perfect time for you know you to kind of go through uh, why you think altered uh, kind of fits that bill. Um, if you can talk a little bit about the game, and you know, for those who may not be familiar or those who are familiar, maybe you've already backed it but um you know it's currently on kickstarter at the moment um i think as as of the recording of this podcast there's about uh 10 days left yeah let's see i pulled up right here i've been responding to to comments myself and the rest of the marketing team we have 10 days left in american dollars we're at 3.2 million right which which is Incredible, right? Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, yeah. I think the only only campaign that did more than that was sorcery. Um, sorcery, yeah. Three point three point five six seven. Not that I have that memorized for any reason. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> not that I'm not that I'm you know paying attention. But yeah, no. Let's you right. know. I we, we still got a long way to go. We still still got to go to course, get there, but hopefully, of course. Um, and you know, I, I was following this project before it hit Kickstarter. You know, I saw some of the marketing materials and and things like that, and I. You know, as soon as I saw it, I knew there was going to be something special about it. But, um, you know, from someone who's actively working on the project, um, you know, can you kind of go through what Altered is, what is special about it, and um, what makes it something that people should care about? All right. So I'm going to I'm going to try to truncate my answer because obviously I could just talk. I could talk about this answer for another another 20 minutes. So I will I will try to not do that for your listeners sake. But 
altered is it's something that uh, I obviously believe is going to be very special. You know, I've been working with magic for the last 11, 11 years. I worked, you know, star city games for 10 years. I contracted with wizards of the coast for the, you know, 12 months leading up to me being, um, you know, taken, taken on at, at Equinox. So I think it's something special, which is why I'm kind of leaving the very warm and consistent uh, arms of magic to try something brand new. But um, Altered is a TCG that I believe has a very wide appeal for a huge swath of people. I think that this is something that is going, this game is going to be something that speaks to casual players that might be just wanting to engage with playing this game, you know, at their home with their friends, which is, you know, as we talked about in the very beginning, that's the largest portion of this market, right? Um, it's, it's a game that is non-combative. You are not, for bet, lack of a better term, trying to punch your opponent in the face until they lose all of their hit points. Um, you're basically trying to win a race to meet, have two of your characters meet on one space. So it's non-combative. It's very bright. Um, the art is absolutely incredible, which I think just about anyone that has, has seen, um, can attest to. And those are, so those are some things that I think are excellent draws to the more casual crowd. But if you want to look on the competitive side, cause I'm a competitive gamer. I mean, I have been my entire life. So I'm, you know, I'm in, I'm in the tournament going crowd. I think altered is an incredibly deep strategic game in a way that is not fully obvious until you start playing. It took me probably about a half dozen games to figure out, even just from the rules, but just playing and figuring out like all of the different things that were going on that could uh, kind of, you know, kind of like unlocked different portions of the game, like as I play every every time I played. Um, So I think it has huge potential to be something that, is a major player in the competitive TCG market because man, the gameplay is so deep and so decision laden, but not in a way that is intimidating to new players. You know, when I first played this game, I played with my partner. She loves board games, but she does not like TCGs at all. That's just not her jam, but she loved altered. And I've now taught this game to, you know, another dozen people. A lot of those people are not TCG fans and they were all like, this is really cool. This is something I actually want to play. And that was one of the things when I was coming on board with Equinox, I'm like, okay, there's something here. Like this is, this is a, this is a group. This is a group of people that is, is not into TCGs that just said, I really want to play that game. And it's a TCG. Um, me looking at it from a competitive standpoint, I know all of the stuff is there for that. And then now seeing through the eyes of so many others, that it's so attractive and so exciting to the casual crowd. I mean, those are the, those are the two groups. And if you can, if you can speak to both of those, I, I think that you can be, I think you can be very successful. Altered is doing a lot of different things. Um, I don't know how much time we had to get into it, but uh, it is a physical card game that has some digital aspects. If you look at a card, I got right here, I'll show you, um, they have QR codes on them, as you can see. A lot of people are like, that's an eyesore. Okay, it's it's not traditional. I'll give you that. Um, I will also say that almost everyone forgets about them after playing a couple of games. Um, you just, They just kind of fade into the background. But either way, I, I get it. That's not necessarily a selling point. But the selling point is what that unlocks, which is um, completely... In my opinion, the thing that's going to kind of t- change the industry, if we can pull off all of the things that we believe that we will, which again, I believe that we will, and that is all of the digital aspects to Altered. So uh, the QR code on each of the cards allows you to scan it to add it to your digital collection. So what happens when you add it to your digital collection? Well, a number of things. One is going back to the initial discussion for organized play, whenever you play in an official altered event, you'll be able to simply uh, register your deck list through the app because all of organized play is going to be available through our app uh, using the deck list that you have made 
and it will match one to one. There will never be, we will not have situations where you are submitting an illegal deck list for anything and you're able to do so with all of the cards that you own digitally on your account. So that's one. Two, you're able to easily buy, sell, trade with other players on our app using our marketplace. And you're probably saying, okay, well, that's not any different from TCG player where the most transactions for any you know, card games are happening in, in North America. You're right. However, uh, the portion where you need to physically make the purchase digitally and then have the card shipped to you, that doesn't necessarily have to remain because the third very cool and interesting and kind of mind-blowing thing is we allow cards to be printed on demand if you own the digital rights to the card. So for example, if I own this card, I can print this card from our official factory. We're partnered with Cardamundi, which you know people in the TCG industry know of, but if maybe if you're not familiar, they print all of Magic the Gathering, they print all of Flesh and Blood, a number of other games. Um, you can you can select any number of your cards to be printed on demand, submit an order, and it will be printed at a Cardamundi factory and shipped directly to your doorstep. So if you're a casual player that doesn't want to engage in uh, official organized play as much, this game will be extremely accessible for you to get into because the physical cardboard will be very easy to find and uh, unlikely to be expensive to acquire. If you are wanting to engage um, at a higher level and play in a lot of tournaments, you can buy and sell on that app very easily and then not have to worry about the physical logistics of shipping cards to and from another person. You can simply just have them printed. Stores also can do the same thing. And they obviously, from a business perspective, they can opt to have kind of two fronts for things that they're selling. They could sell their physical card inventory to people that are not interested in using those specific cards in events. They could sell their digital card inventory just as they do now, as, as the vast majority of like kind of singles, you know, as we call them, singles transactions are pretty much all digital as, as, the, as the base. Um, so should be something that's very attractive for retailers for an opportunity for them to operate on both fronts where they can, they can manage their inventory easier, um, manage all of their purchases easier, and be able to sell any number of physical cards that they can manage their own inventory because they can simply just print more and then sell those um, in their physical storefront. So we're doing a lot of things that are ambitious. And I know that um, a lot of people, and this is understandable, a lot of people need to see it happen before they're like, yeah, I, I believe in this project. And that's fine. We are, we are not here saying absolutely under no circumstance, just believe exactly what we're saying. We want to show you. And the game launches August 26th. If you're not a believer yet, no problem. That's fine. Just wait a little bit. And, and come back and see us in six months and then and then we'll be able to show you. But once the game is launched and we're successful and you see how all of these things work, you can jump on then. But if you do it right now, and I don't know when this podcast is going to release, but uh, I would hate for you to miss out on all of the excellent Kickstarter rewards for, for not being kind of an early adopter. So that is my quick pitch. I, I think it was under 20 minutes, probably a little <laughs> over a minute. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's perfect all. because um, this is definitely a game that, um, I mean, a lot of people are interested in if you just visit the Kickstarter page. Uh, this episode will probably be up, you know, within a day, I, I would imagine, like maybe tomorrow or the next day. So uh, right. if you're hearing this when it first comes out, your know, campaign will probably still be live. Like many other people, you're probably doing late pledges and, and things like that. Um, We're actually not because the game is launching in August and we are trying to get the Kickstarter product into the hands of the people that purchased it by the end of July. So this is going to the printer immediately after the campaign ends. All right. Well, so if you're hearing this, it's ending on <laughs> February 29th period, yeah. no matter what. All right. All right. Well, I mean, Hey, sense of urgency. I like it. Um, yeah, yeah, well, if you're hearing it, get on, you know, let's let's hop on. I think at this... you got about a week. Yeah, and I think what, what does kind of speak volumes to uh, what makes this project special is um, not not the amount that's raised, but the amount of backers. 
I right. think about eight and a half that or not eight and a half thousand. <laughs> it is eight and a half thousand. But I don't know why I say it like that. Eighty five hundred backers. Um, right so far in the campaign and that that really speaks volumes to the people who are interested in this product you know your average buy-in price is is very consumer level and not like this big uh, bloated figure um so right. and you're, you're gonna have it just speaks volumes to uh the community that's going to be accessible to the game so very excited for this project um you know before we hop off here is you know is there a way for people to kind of contact you about it uh, about altered uh you know where can people go to visit uh, to learn more about the game and do you have any other resources um regarding the project absolutely so our homepage is altered.gg that's where you can you can you can make an account to get you access to everything on the website which includes all of the cards that we revealed a truly crazy amount of lore that our narrative designer has written he said somewhere between um, Lord of the Rings and Dune is the amount of words that he's written for <laughs> for the game, oh, and I, it's true. <laughs> Scarily, it's true. Uh, but that's that is our that is our uh, that is our website. Go over there, make you an account right now. A couple of other things: the Discord, our official Discord server, that is where the community right now is most active, um, as well as people that are you know. Within Equinox, we're in there frequently answering questions, chatting with everyone. I'm trying to convert people to Yzmir, which is my favorite faction. Um, of course. <laughs> so that's like an ongoing process. Mm. It's not difficult. They're, we're the best faction. So, um, But, uh, you know, some people, that t- it takes some time for them to see light, so I understand. So the Discord. Personally, uh, I am most active on Twitter, which is my handle is at jparnell1 on Twitter. And these days, I am pretty much only talking about altered so if you're interested in altered then that is the place to go um i think i'm well probably the largest um english speaking person that that talks about it on a a regular basis and let's see oh board game arena so board game arena we have our starter decks which you are able to play if you've not played altered which is just boardgamearena.com you can make a free account and try any of our starter decks against people whenever you want have you jay have you had a chance to play altered yet no no i've looked extensively in the game i've read the rules um i've looked at tutorial videos but i have not had a chance to actually play the game yet okay well you need to go over to board game (laughs) well thanks yeah i'll do that yeah um no that's exciting Uh, that's absolutely exciting and i've I've seen that y'all have six starter decks as well as the um you know the pack products and things like that so um well justin this has been a wealth of information um i I'm very excited. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of other people are excited. And, um, you know, this is definitely a project that is is one of those special ones that comes along, you know, every now and then that I think does really make waves and, and makes, you know, really good changes in the industry. So uh, once again, Justin, thank you for being on here, talking about organized play. And, um, you know, I, I wish you luck. You guys are already <laughs> doing just fine, but I wish you all the luck in the world with, with uh, this project. Thank you so much. You know, we're, we're, we feel good about where we are right now, but we can always use more luck. So I appreciate it, Jay. And thank you having, for having me on so much. I enjoyed our chat. So, um, you know, if you ever want me back, just let me know. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. All right. So that was Justin Parnell, who is the organized play manager for North America for Equinox, who is the developer of Altered TCG, uh, which is still live on Kickstarter as of the time of of this podcast releasing um and as justin said in the video uh there won't be any um elite pledges or anything like that so if you do want to hop on and 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 support the game now and uh get it early and and really you know get going with altered uh now's the time to do it so um but we had a lot of good conversation about organized play um as as justin mentioned there is a lot of uh, it's a big spectrum from you know casual events to highly competitive events. Um, but more importantly, talking about the benefit that organized play can bring to a game um, and knowing that it doesn't have to be this uh, very daunting task of um, these, these big, high-energy, high-level tournaments. It could simply just be something that you um, try and foster within a local community to get people to play the game, uh, to get local stores to... Um, you know, put, you know, put events together and uh, things like that. So a lot of good information there. So if you like what we talked about today about organized play and just kind of that aspect of TCGs and want to kind of follow uh, more about, you know, other aspects of TCG design, 
uh, production operations, things like that. Uh, you know, feel free to follow this podcast, follow this uh, series. Um, you can also reach out to me. My email is j at the boosterpack Our social media handles are at TBPN content. Um, and I'm always open for suggestions on, on what topics to cover for TCGs. I know it's a niche space, but it does uh, a lot of this information is related to the tabletop game space in general. And um, like with Altered, uh, you know, there's just a lot of exciting projects out there that, um, you know, we have yet to know about and yet to be discovered. So really excited about what's coming up, uh, not only for this project, but for everything else. So like I said, if you wanted to ask me any questions, you can email me, you can get to us at our social media handles. Um, but as always, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time. <laughs>